Grace and peace to you on this Sunday morning. It is the 4th of July. It is the day that we celebrate Holy Communion. And beloved, I am so glad to be with you here online. I pray that God's blessing and best is happening in your life. Beloved, we have a chat that is available for you here on Facebook Live. And we want to encourage you to go ahead and join the chat by simply letting us know where you're worshiping from and who you are on this morning. We want to set the fireworks off in our worship on today. And it is with our praise and worship and our love for Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, if this is your first time joining with us, know that we are always here, same time, same channel, every Sunday morning at 1030. And we want to encourage you to stay tuned as we continue to share God's blessings in our life. On this morning, we will have Holy Communion. We will have a time of praise and worship, and we want you to stay tuned for what God has in store. Now, beloved, let us prepare ourselves as we go into a time of praise and worship. We invite you to stand on your feet and let's give God some praise on this day. Everywhere we look, we can see the imprint of God. From the loftiest mountain to the crashing waters of the sea, there's God's greatness that stands majestically. God's greatness can be within the human heart. And this morning, I want to invite you to honor and praise God with acts of loving kindness and compassion. Come, listen to the word of the Lord. Help us to receive God's word and direction for our lives. Proclaim the goodness of God's love. Let our voice and our actions be filled with love. Come, now is the time to worship. Open your eyes, open your hearts, and open your spirits this day. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for 
yet this fantastic day, a day where the sun is shining, the wind is slowly blowing, and we can feel your presence as the trees move backwards and forth. We can feel you moving in our lives as well, God, for you woke us up this morning, you clothed us in our right mind and allowed us to see yet this beautiful day. Oh God, we know that you are present, we know that you are with us, and so, God, we ask that while we tarry for this moment to hear your word, we ask, God, that you would speak to us. Reveal more of yourself to us, God, so that when we are done with this worship celebration on this day, we will leave knowing that we have communed with you, not just in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, but by your presence with us as well. And so come, Holy Spirit, come, Heavenly Dove, come and descend upon us as we worship this day. May the words of our mouths, may the inspiration that is within our hearts, may it bring praise to you, O oh God. From our lips, O oh God, to you, may everything we say be pleasing in your sight. From the things that we do, God, may our actions bring you glory. And so, God, we ask that you would touch this word, that it might bring forth life today. We pray for the sick. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask that you would just continue to surround them, heal and mold. Use us, God, to bear someone else's burden and thus fulfill the laws of Jesus Christ. Help us to reach out, to get in the ditch, to hold somebody's hand, and to help them through their trying time. Lord God, we know not what to say, but you will give us the words, and our presence with you brings forth so much comfort. So God, we pray, we thank you for the continued healing of Sister Joyce Madison. We praise you, God, that she is resting at home. We praise you, God, for healing. And Lord God, we pray for Brother Rodney that you would just be with him this week as he goes back in for surgery to work on that knee again. Lord God, we just pray that you would continue to heal, mend, oh Lord God, and give him the spirit of rest to let you do what you need to do, oh God to bring healing. Oh God, we thank you. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
one of the most jarring sentences in the Bible goes something like this. If I give away all I have and if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. It jars us because Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And he taught that one of the ways to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and bless those who persecute us is to give freely of our possessions. But here, beloved, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says that you can give everything away and even lay down your life and yet not be acting in love. You can make the final sacrifice and still be lost forever. Beloved, on this 4th of July Holy Communion Celebration Sunday, I want to spend time dealing with Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 through 15. I'm reminded on this day, 4th of July, that we celebrate freedom and liberty. And so this morning, I want to spend a little time defining the difference between liberty and license. Let me help you out this morning. It simply means that right-wing and left-wing Christian political activity must be exposed to a radical biblical critique. On the right, we are summoned to work for the rights of unborn humans, a strong defense, nuclear superiority, prayer in public schools, the support of Israel, family values, balanced budgets. On the left, we are summoned to work for a more just distribution of the world's goods, nuclear disarmament, and the end of interventionist politics in places like El Salvador and Nicaragua, ERA, programs to combat poverty and unemployment. The Christian right and the Christian left are summoning us to action, and rightly so. If there is one thing Jesus cannot be accused of is indifference to the needs of people. But beloved, there is a radical biblical critique which Christians on the right and Christians on the left must never forget. If I give away all I have and I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Or let me put it very simply, you can go to hell fighting for poverty programs and you can go to hell fighting for a prayer amendment because love can never be defined simply as mere deeds. It always involves the condition of the heart of the doer. If we want to bring the message of the Bible to bear on the problems of the world that surrounds us, we need to realize that the Bible is much more radical than the agenda of the right or the agenda of the left. It says to both the left and the right, though you give your body to be burned in the service of your agenda and have not love, you gain nothing. Love can never be equated with anyone's agenda because no agenda is love unless it comes from a certain kind of heart. We might be impressed with a person who gives a million dollars to, say, build a hospital, but God looks on the heart and queries the hidden motives of the soul. Christianity is not primarily an agenda for the political activity. It is primarily a power that radically changes the human heart. Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 through uh, 16. Beloved, I invite you to join me there on this morning. And it simply says in Galatians 5 verse 13, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That, beloved, is an act of true freedom. If you bite each other, watch out. In no time at all, 
you will be annihilating each other, and where will your precious freedom be then? Beloved, there is a great lesson in these verses of Scripture. It is a lesson that is taught by our local, state, federal governments, our schools, and our parents. It is a universal lesson taught by democratic nations, and that lesson is the difference between liberty and license. Allow me to break it down in the simplest terms as I possibly can. As citizens, you do have certain rights. You have the right to free speech, but you do not have the right to slander your neighbor. You have the right to bear arms, but you do not have the right to commit murder. You have the right to worship freely, but you do not have the right to impose your religion on others. You have the right to privacy within your home, but you do not have the right to break the law within your home. You have the right to vote, but you do not have the right to vote more than once in any one election. The first thing I want us to understand on this Sunday is that liberty is tough to apply. You see, it is prone to abuses. The United States has discovered the, that the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness we work so diligently to protect also exposes the frequent inability of man to adhere to the parameters of his liberty. We declare that all men should be free, but for years we grew this nation's economy with slaves. We declare that men have the right to bear arms, but we can't seem to stop the drive-by shootings that are killing innocent people. We declare that every citizen is entitled to freedom of speech, but our protests often incite seditious behavior. What we have discovered, beloved, is that the application of liberty is a tricky thing. We have found that there is such a thing as too much liberty. Paul wrote way back in antiquity that liberty cannot be used as a wholesale excuse to do whatever you want to do. The idea of anything goes was troubling mankind then, and it is troubling mankind now. It was once said that a man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do as he likes. Well, beloved, liberty proves that man has difficulty behaving himself. Liberty then must have certain restrictions. And beloved, the challenge comes in learning to constrain our liberty and to bring it into submission to the highest form of servitude, that of putting others first. Putting others first, beloved, is a tough sale. It was tough back then for Jesus when Jesus told, remember the rich young man, he told him to sell all that he had and come back and follow me. Well, the young man left troubled and did not return. He couldn't put others ahead of himself. Beloved, if we are going to reach for the highest liberty attainable, then we must accept that it is not governed by the flesh, but that it is governed by the spirit. The flesh accepts the command to love thy neighbor, but the spirit gives the command to love thy enemies. The flesh accepts that stealing is a crime, but the Spirit says a Christian must not cheat on their income tax. You get the picture. What the flesh cannot do, the Spirit of God can do. Real liberty is behaving when nobody is watching. Beloved, we cannot treasure our liberty and privileges in Christ and trash the law and the principles of God from whence whose freedom spring. If we value the former and we violate the latter, we of necessity, we forfeit both. Beloved, our liberty to pray is under attack. The removal of corporate prayer in the schools is the best, but not only one example. There are some states that prohibit prayer before a sports event. Others prohibit prayer in public assemblies of any kind. Those who do allow prayer require a watered-down prayer that does not cite Jesus Christ, the one who gave that liberty in the first place. For example, superior judge that presides in Charlotte, North Carolina, his honor had begun each session of court bowing his head and silently asking for divine guidance. But wouldn't you know it? Five lawyers 
and the North Carolina Civil Liberties Union formed an alliance to demand that his praying must be stopped. This judge defends his prayers, saying that he is trying to set the tone for a solemn and dignified atmosphere in the courtroom. The alliance argued that it's not legal to use religion to control the atmosphere. Beloved, can you imagine what would happen if the laws of Christianity were removed from our everyday life? If our atmosphere was no longer controlled by any religion, where do these brilliant minds think the laws of civil society came from? It's unlawful to commit murder, thou shalt not kill. It's unlawful to steal another man's possessions, thou shalt not steal. It's unlawful to rape, thou shalt not covet. Remember the influence of religion on our country and you will see the rate of crime, murder, adultery, lying, stealing, rape, fornication, cheating, and some crimes that are yet to even be discovered skyrocket. No one has done more to turn liberty into an occasion of the flesh than the American Civil Liberties Union. This union, beloved, which was intended to protect our liberties, has done more to eradicate them. Beloved, they successfully fought to remove the Ten Commandments from the courtrooms in Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, and Tennessee in the name of liberty. They fought to remove the practice of prayer or religious ceremony in any setting where the public money is being used in the name of liberty. They claim to protect our freedom of speech, but they fight to limit what we can say and where we can say it. Liberty, as you can see, is tough to protect. Finally, beloved, liberty is tough to share. Paul says in our text today that liberty is meant to be shared. It's a heavenly commodity with earthly application. It's not something that you possess. It's something that you give away. As Christians, Christ sets us free. We are set free from all law and all restraints. We are under nothing, absolutely nothing, but Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our law. Christ gave himself up for us, and we know it. We are now free from mankind, but we are bound to Jesus Christ. And all we want to do is please Jesus Christ. Sharing our liberty with others means giving up some of our own Christ sacrificed his own liberty and was bound to a cross that we might be free. If you are truly free, you are willing to give up self and by love serve one another. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Through love. Be servants of one another. You were called, beloved, to freedom. Through love, serve one another. You were called to freedom from servitude. Now in love, submit to servitude. Here's the question, beloved, that we should ask. Why is love which serves the needs of others the only way Christian freedom can express itself? Why are the call to freedom and the call to love synonymous? When Paul says, don't use your freedoms, beloved, when he tells you don't lose your freedoms as an opportunity for the flesh, he simply means that if you try, you lose your freedom. Verse 1 says, you submit again to a yoke of slavery. The works of the flesh and the fruit of love are not two different optional ways to live in freedom. When you live according to the flesh, you are in slavery. But when you serve each other in love, you are in freedom. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because love is motivated by the joy of sharing our fullness. But the works of the flesh are motivated by the desire to feel our emptiness. 
The meaning of flesh here is not the physical part of man, but man's ego, which feels a deep emptiness and uses the means within its own power to feel that emptiness. If it is religious, it may use law. If it is non-religious, it may use booze. But one thing is sure, the flesh is not free. It is enslaved to one futile desire after another in its efforts to feel an emptiness which only Christ can feel. So when Paul says in verse 13, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, he means don't surrender the freedom that you have in the all-satisfying Jesus Christ to return to the unsatisfying desires for mere physical pleasures or self-exaltation. I know that there is someone who is asking, well, what is real liberty? It's the freedom to be Christ-like towards your enemy. The freedom to be Christ-like when you are criticized. The freedom to be Christ-like when your resources are needed to help someone. The freedom to be Christ-like when someone needs your sympathy or empathy. The freedom to be Christ-like when someone needs a little kindness and gentleness. It's the freedom to help someone who does not deserve your help. It's the freedom to help someone who others say is not worth the effort. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Beloved, I was standing in line at the post office talking to a very pleasant elderly woman who told me that she went to this particular post office because the postal employees there were so friendly. She had come to buy some stamps. And since the line was very long, I simply pointed out to her that, you know, ma'am, there's no need for you to wait in line. You can simply buy your stamps over there at the machine in the lobby. She says, I know, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. Beloved, liberty is tough to apply. Liberty is tough to protect. But liberty does not have to be tough to share. We can give up a little time to show concern for others. We can give up a little money to help others. We can give a little. Why? Because Christ Jesus gave his all. I know that Americans died, beloved, so that we may have liberty. But we serve a Savior who died that we might have life. He came to offer himself as a sacrifice so we might live. And those who follow Jesus also died to this world so that we can enjoy the full liberty of salvation. It does not matter whether you came to this nation on the Mayflower or on a slave ship. We should be able to look at our own family's history, look at our own family struggles, and see how God has has brought us from where we were to liberty. Whether it's from the poverty of the barrios or the abject neglect of the ghetto, every child of God should be able to say the love of God has given me liberty. Beloved, God has brought us from a mighty long way. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. But Jesus Christ said, give me death so that they may have liberty. Jesus said, no greater love can a man have than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. I have come that they might have a life. I have come that they might have life more abundantly. Give me their burdens so that they will have liberty of living a life where the burdens are light. Beloved, I want you to know on this Sunday that God has given us many liberties, but the best is yet to come. God has opened many doors for us, but guess what? There is still something on the way. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth 
is marching on. I've come to tell somebody today that liberty is on the way. Christ set at liberty them that were bruised. That's you, y'all. That's me. Your liberty has been turned your sorrows into joy. Your liberty has turned your darkness into light. Your liberty has turned your greed into giving. Your liberty has turned your blemished life into beauty. Your liberty has turned your flaws into perfection. So what's the goal of all of this today? I want you to use that liberty. Not the liberty that the world has given you. I want you to use the liberty that Christ has given you. Not as an occasion to the flesh, but I want you to use that liberty to love. Use that liberty to serve. Use that liberty that only Christ has given you for the glory of God. Liberty versus license. I choose liberty in Christ.
Well, beloved, I don't know about you, but I had a wonderful time in worship on this Sunday. Beloved, I pray that the word of God has gone forth in your life and has encouraged you and allowed you to realize and understand the difference between liberty and license. Beloved, I want to remind you that our liberty, our freedom, is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross and set you and I free. I want you on this Fourth, uh, 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 Fourth of July today, I want you to be free. I want you to be free today to celebrate all that God is doing in your life. Beloved, wherever you go today, I want you to share the blessings of God with all that you come in contact with. Let somebody know that you love them. Let somebody know that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Beloved, I want to pray this benediction upon you as we leave today. Go in confidence. Know that God goes with you to give you words of hope, uh, communion, and peace. May God's love flow through you to all those you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Make it a great week, beloved. Go out, get into that sun, and celebrate all that God has given you. I will see you next week. Now remember, next Sunday, we will be online only. Online only next week. But the following week, we will be back in person. I am so glad for those of you who came out today uh, to join us for in-person worship. It was so wonderful being with each and every one of you. And I look forward to seeing you on third Sunday as we gather back in-person worship, third Sunday in July, as we celebrate one more time. God bless you.